Um, uh, so I, I think uh, we're going to get a good uh, set of Q and A's from your old friends as well. <laughs> okay. Let's Well, good morning, evening, and afternoon, and happy new year to our online audience members, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Russell Shao. I am the executive director of the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated to Taiwan policy research and related programs. Uh, I'm very pleased to note that this fall will mark the five-year anniversary of our organization. Uh, our mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed discussion about Taiwan and its people. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. Those programs include a bi-weekly online journal called the Global Taiwan Brief, where we publish concise, thoughtful, and high-impact policy analysis written by U.S. and international experts focused on Taiwan. Regular seminars like today's event where we feature interesting thought leaders and discuss policy relevant issues related to Taiwan. An annual symposium held in the fall where we congregate current and former policymakers and leading academics for a full day event to discuss the past, present and future of US Taiwan relations. In addition to these core programs, we offer scholarship opportunities for US researchers, young and old, to conduct short-term field research in Taiwan and for Taiwanese researchers to conduct short-term field research here in the United States. We recently relaunched our audio podcast, GTI Insights, that featured timely conversations with experts from around the world. Finally, we also host cultural programs that help to highlight the diversity of Taiwan society. For instance, last year, we held our first ever virtual Taiwanese film festival. Now, if you're not already subscribed to receive all our program updates, you can do so by signing and signing up for free on our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. I would be remiss, you know, at this opening event for 2021, if I did not thank our co-founders, our board of directors, advisors, general supporters, and all our staff as well as interns for making everything that we do here possible. Now let's begin today's program. I'm especially delighted to present today's event, not only because it is our first event in 2021 and we can finally all bid farewell to 2020, but because we, we have a truly a special guest now, before I introduce him, just a bit of history. On April 10th, 1979, President Jimmy Carter signed the Taiwan Relations Act into law. This year marks the 41st anniversary of this extraordinary domestic law, which was enacted to legally govern the informal relations between the United States and Taiwan, following the normalization of relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China. After more than 40 years, it is easy to take for granted the considerable debate between the executive branch, which wanted to honor its commitments to the PRC, and the legislative branch, which wanted to maintain US relations with Taiwan and its people. The critical role that the TRA continues to play as the cornerstone of managing relations between the United States and Taiwan truly deserves a closer examination of the consideration and the legislative intent that led to its enactment. And more importantly, their application to the circumstances in which the relationship exists today or decades later. We cannot have found a better person to shed light on the history of, the, of that legislation. And I'm absolutely honored to be able to have uh, one of our, the primary architects of what became the Taiwan Relations Act with us here today, former Congressman Lester Wolf. The Honorable Lester Wolf is a retired American politician and former Democratic member of the United States House of Representatives from New York, serving from 1965 to 1981. During his time in Congress, Wolf acted as 
chairman of the Asian and Pacific Affairs Committee, as well as the Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control. In 1978, he led a congressional delegations to the People's Republic of China, which included a widely publicized meeting with Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping. Wolf was also one of the key authors of the Taiwan Relations Act, signed into law in 1979. And following his congressional career, he has served as president of the International Trade and Development Agency, director of the Pacific Community Institute at Turo College, and director of the Griffin Corporation. He is the author of several books on foreign policy and has hosted a weekly show on PBS. <clears throat> For his achievements, Representative Wolf received the World Peace Prize top honor in 2010, as well as the Congressional Gold, Mo Gold Medal in 2014. Most relevant to our discussion here today, Representative Wolf is also the author of a recently published book called The Legislative Intent of the Taiwan Relations Act, A Dilemma Wrapped in an Enigma, in which I cannot talk, wait to talk to him about here today in our discussion. Representative Wolf, thank you and welcome to GTI's virtual seminar. Well, thank you very much for having me. Now, before we begin, uh, I think it's very uh, important that we wish you a very happy birthday. I believe you just turned a spry 102, am I correct? Oh, thank you. <laughs> You've certainly probably forgotten more about the TRA than many of us will ever know. So I am very delighted and excited to talk to you today. Um, let's jump in. As often with these conversations that we host, uh, I do want to uh, let our audience members know that we will be taking questions uh, from the audience uh, for the 15 minutes uh, at the end of today's session. Uh, due to the, uh, the, uh, the delay uh, as a result of technical difficulties, we will be extending out uh, the original uh, end time so that we can accommodate those questions. I know that we've already received several very good questions from some of your old friends, uh, Representative Wolf. Uh, but uh, for the purpose of our, uh, of our opening discussion, I've prepared several um, uh, uh, questions uh, to, to get the discussion going. And, um, and I'd like to kick things off with really um, um, a, 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 a question for you with regards to really the motivation and the inspiration for you to decide to pursue this, uh, this, this book project, uh, to write this book, uh, to compile this book, The Legislative Intent of the, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act. Over to you, Representative Wolf. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, if you... Uh, when we get uh, to really uh, the uh, impetus uh, for this, uh, for the book, you have to go back to why the act was written in the first place and give some history to it. Uh, when, the, uh, when we established relations, uh, informal relations uh, with China, uh, Congress was never informed. And there were a lot of secret communications that went back and forth between uh, Zhou Enlai, Mao Zedong, and uh, Kissinger and Nixon. And that was something that was withheld from the Congress. And it took oh, about six or seven years uh, to get to the point where we uh, had uh, the idea of establishing, not we, but China came in and said uh, to me, um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Joe, uh, the uh, uh, vice minister, Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. said to me, uh, we ought to restart these negotiations. I passed the message on uh, to Jimmy Carter. And within two weeks, we had the start of what was the formal relationship uh, or informal relationship with Taiwan. Congress was incensed at the fact that we were kept in the dark on both counts and got the initial information. I was given the initial information uh, 15 minutes before they went on the air and declared 
uh, mm. the, the new relationship uh, with uh, China. And uh, it became important uh, for us to have some measure of protecting the people of Taiwan from being put into a position that they may not want, uh, may not want it to. And uh, with that as background, let me say this. We created a, a piece of legislation that is unique and has not had parallel. Uh, it was called the Taiwan Relations Act. Why? Because of the fact that uh, 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 actually Carter sent up to us something known as the, Carter, as the Taiwan Enabling Act, which had no provisions in it uh, for the escape of Taiwan uh, from ta having been taken over by someone they didn't want them to rule. And uh, we made the act uh, very uh, ambiguous uh, because of the fact we had to pass it to the hardliners and the liberals who did not want to in any way to serve the relationship that was being built with China. And as a result of which, you have an act that has survived for more than 40 years because of its ambiguity. But now the ambiguity, I think, has to be in some way clarified because of the recent tensions between Taiwan uh, and China and China and the United States. Well, that's that's wonderful. That thank you for very much for that for the history, and we'll we'll dive into that even even more even more so throughout the course of our, our uh, the rest of the questions. Um, but I want to focus again a bit on on, on the, sort of the bigger picture again here. Um, I found the book uh, fascinating, uh, and it's really a, an excellent um, uh, resource uh, for researchers like myself who focus on uh, on, on Taiwan policy. And in, and, the, and the very interesting aspect of your book is that you focus on legislative intent. I mean, this is in the title, on the very beginning of your title of your book. Um, and as a student of the law myself, I, I caught my attention because, you know, legislative intent is one of the key elements of judicial interpretation. So, so why did you decide to focus on this particular element uh, in, uh, for, for, for a book related to Taiwan policy? I'm sorry, would you repeat that, please? Uh, why did you focus uh, on le the legislative intent? What is the significance of legislative intent of uh, in, in, in your book related to uh, the Taiwan Relations Act? Well, uh, actually, uh, there is need to understand why the act was written and how it was written. That's the important element. And that's why I uh, decided uh, some two years ago uh, with my uh, assistant, uh, uh, actually uh, Michael Yorg, who helped me to put this book together. And we decided that it was time to clarify some of the intent of Congress when we wrote the legislation. We intended it to be a, a piece of legislation that would be lasting and not something that would be just a transient uh, piece of legislation. And that is why we put in the various clauses that we did. For example, one element that's involved here is the question of arms sales. Now you will find in the book, you will find the, the uh, uh, actual elements uh, that went into defining that particular part. In other words, I recall during the debate, I brought up the question of, will China have any role in deciding what type of armament or what type of equipment will go to Taiwan? And it was unequivocally stated that China should have and never should have any role in the determination of what arms go to, uh, to uh, uh, Taiwan. Basically, as well, we said that it was not to be uh, the type of arms that were outmoded, but was to be state-of-the-art type of arms so that Taiwan could defend itself in the event of attack. One thing that has 
really goaded me into continued support uh, for the legislation and for its intent with the fact that China has never ruled out the use of arms in order to achieve unification. And that I think is an important element. I think we've got to do in some way, uh, uh, bring the temperature down now as a result of uh, the uh, recent president, uh, Trump, and his initiatives in trying to help Taiwan, he has only exacerbated the situation because of the fact that neither side should be provocative. It's always a good idea to keep your head down when you get into some sort of a struggle. You know, what I found especially helpful with, the, with your book is that you go through each clause, uh, the major clauses of the Taiwan Relations Act, and then you provide the legislative debate that uh, that went on, uh, and so I thought that that was especially helpful to understand again the, the the context or how each clause of the Taiwan Relations Act came about, and and I, and and I really thank you for 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 that, uh, for doing all that um, all that work. Um, sticking again to the overall picture here, and and I think it's important for the framing of this because this is such a I think a critical um, uh, uh, reference material that you've created here is what did you mean by a dilemma wrapped in an enigma? Like, what is the dilemma and what is the enigma here in, 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 in your equation? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that last part. Uh, what is the dilemma and what is the enigma? Like, how, how do you do, how do, you do yeah. The dilemma is where, sh where should we go on this? Yeah. Uh, in other words, uh, there is the fact that there's a China, and there is a Taiwan. But what is what is the status of, of, of this? And the fact that neither side has been provocative and uh, moved in any direction is the dilemma, dilemma that is faced uh, by uh, the United States government. And you see, uh, one of the elements in this uh, entire situation is the fact that we threw the decision making uh, into uh, the Congress of the United States. All of the communiques and all of the assurances are really just executive communications and have no effect and have no uh, a rule of law. The only law that exists is the Taiwan Relations Act, which was passed by more than two thirds of Congress, overriding what could be a veto and signed by the president. Until that is repealed, the United States relationship with China and the United and uh, Taiwan will be affected and governed by what is in the Taiwan Relations Act. That, that's that's excellent. That's uh, you know that really gets to one of the, the heart of uh, you know the broader uh, the broader policy debate that goes on uh, certainly in Washington as you're uh, as you are certainly well aware of. But really, sort of you know the weight of the different authorities of uh, of the different uh, measures that um, that 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 affect uh, U.S. policy towards Taiwan and, and China. And I think you know I think you you, you spoke with great clarity there in terms of you know, the Taiwan Relations Act as being the primary authority in terms of what should govern U.S. relations with Taiwan and that, you know, the three different communiques that, um, you know, in, in your, in, in your <laughs> what you've just said are executive communications and, and have no weight of law at, and that's, um, and, and the, Taiwan, the TRA is, is a U.S. domestic law and therefore um, is, uh, is, is the primary authority there. Um, you, you know, um, you know, your book uh, and what you've just mentioned right now or earlier is that you, you've captured a very uh, riveting legislative history um, over the debate uh, about the TRA. Can, can you go over some of what you thought were the key elements of those debates uh, as being someone who was, uh, you know, there and, 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 and it was saw it all to, to, to actually separate it? to have uh, engaged in the debate uh, substantively, um, what, were, what, what were the key elements of, of those debates? Uh, I'm sorry, I always lose the last part of what you say. Oh, what 
what were the key elements of the legislative debate uh, that went into the uh, enactment of the Taiwan Relations Act? Uh, one of the elements, I'm sorry. The elements, yes, the key elements. Well, uh, the, the continuing relationship uh, with the United States and what will happen uh, to uh, Taiwan if the mainland uh, begins an attack. That's one element. And we must understand this. Here we go back to the ambiguity again. Uh, when I say that, because of the fact that this act uh, does not supersede the ability of the United States uh, to uh, respond uh, to a, an attack. And the attack is not on the mainland. Taiwan is not part of of the United States. And we must understand that it is subject uh, to the Constitution, uh, which states very clearly that Congress shall be the one to make the determination for war. So therefore, it is not an automatic response uh, that is triggered. Uh, and we also must understand that it, the action of the United States is governed uh, by uh, the War Powers Act, which too uh, enters the picture here. So uh, one of the things I think that is very important is the fact that neither Taiwan or China uh, should engage in provocative acts. Uh, it's in the interest of both Taiwan, the Taiwan people, and, and uh, the Chinese and the Chinese people to avoid war. Uh, think of all the wonderful, you know, the, uh, I was awarded a peace prize some years ago. Why? Because that was my basic interest in being part of the leadership on the TRA itself. Avoiding war. Uh, it's in neither side, either Taiwan side or Chinese side to engage in uh, provocative acts or in uh, actual combat because uh, Taiwan has prospered and become a tremendous uh, uh, leader in democracy and uh, I see too that the fact that uh, China has become an enormous, uh, an enormous uh, factor, had an enormous uh, increase in its ability uh, and its economic base. So it's in neither side to, uh, to engage in, in conflict of any sort uh, I think it's time uh, to start the ping pong diplomacy once again. Hmm. Oh, very interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned, you, you referenced um, uh, just in your remarks right now the the importance of preserving peace, and that the you know the um, the one of the essential purposes of the TRA is to maintain peace um, in, in 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 the Taiwan Strait, um, and and I think. A broader context of the uh, of the of of the TRA is that, of course, the backdrop is the normalization of relations with the PRC, which I, I think um, uh, most law lawmakers at the time agreed or at least recognized the necessity of doing so. Uh, but given the ongoing strategic competition with China. Um, the and, and you know really the um, the rise of China and, and its uh, authoritarian capitalist model. Do you feel like you and perhaps other lawmakers at the time were perhaps misled by your expectations and and hope for China? You, you know you noted earlier that you know that the the, the the situation has changed considerably with with uh, and the need to sort of uh, shift away from. Um, uh, ambiguity a bit. Um, 
So, so what do you feel like, you know, the, uh, what is the current course of, uh, of U.S. China relations? And, and do you feel like uh, maybe the, uh, the, the course correction that we saw uh, over the past decade is, uh, is, is um, should that, does that need to continue in your view? Well, I, I, I think there's going to be a very uh, drastic change of, of policy uh, as a result of this new administration. And I think that there's one aspect in all of this uh, that I think is important. I think it has, uh, I think China, uh, Taiwan, I, I should say, has done a great job in, in bringing democracy to the people. And I think that they have, they should be congratulated uh, for the uh, economic successes that they have achieved. But one thing that they haven't done is keep pace with the idea of telling the American people how valuable their uh, association has been with the United States. I think that they have fallen down uh, in acquainting the people with, Taiwan, with what Taiwan is all about. Uh, I think if you ask the average person in the United States today, uh, I think that they could not distinguish between Taiwan and Thailand. And that's unfortunate. I don't think that they have done the job that they must do in acquainting the people of the importance of Taiwan to, the, to America. Uh, and uh, with the new administration, I think the job is doubly important. I, I, I just wanted to show you something a moment. These are the original transcripts of my uh, uh, meeting with Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. which I kept and had never been released before and are released in the, uh, uh, in the book. Uh, another thing, I have some pictures here, if you don't permit me to. I did not put them into the book, but I, they may be interesting. Oh. Here is a picture of my meeting with, I don't know whether you can see it. A little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah, I see, I see Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, uh, but maybe you got to move it to the little right, a little, oh, left, 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 a little bit more to your left. Yeah, okay, more left. That's with Deng Xiaoping. Uh -huh. Yep, see and that. He and I discussed uh, these various things. Here are some pictures of the ladies with Kissinger. And with during the period of uh, when we had informal relationships, I invited the representatives of China uh, to come to my office and discuss uh, the uh, various problems that we were having mm -hmm. on an uh, informal basis. I remember we, we had uh, brown bag lunches together mm -hmm. at that time. <laughs> Uh, going forward and today, I think really that there has to be much more in the way of trying to provide, again, the American people uh, with what Taiwan is all about. It's not enough uh, to run advertising, and that used to be my field. It's not enough to run advertising about the uh, wonderful vacations people can have in Taiwan. It's more important to show that Taiwan has, it, with their uh, uh, purchases of various products of America, uh, that contribute to jobs in America. It is that type of thing that I think that we should be uh, if we are in any way anxious to preserve the relationship between Taiwan and the United States, there must be more in the way of uh, education uh, of the American public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I mean, if, if we could just, you know, you, you show that picture of, of you and, uh, and um, 
and, and to Chaoping. And there, uh, and then you included the uh, the transcript in your book. Uh, maybe just briefly for our audience members, you know, what was what what was the significance of that meeting, and what what was the sort of the insight that you um, you know that you found was most important for uh, you know how U.S. Taiwan relations or U.S. China relations evolved. Well, let let me say this that at the time the formal meeting that uh, actually the result. Uh, came about as, as, as uh, I was on a congressional trip uh, to China and uh, uh, we had to go through the chairs and meeting with various people before we got to meet with Dong. But uh, the, the formal meeting actually produced uh, very little except for the idea of opening the avenue of uh, some sort of of uh, changing from the uh, lethargic pace of uh, what we were doing and uh, trying to bring it up to date. It was after the meeting that Dong took me aside and said, I want you to tell your president that I want to put Taiwan aside and this is his exact words, Taiwan will fall like a ripe apple from the tree. <laughs> uh, and he said, tell your, uh, your president, and that was Carter. He said, tell him uh, to put Taiwan aside and concentrate on what we can do together. And that was very significant because of the fact that Taiwan has always been a principal issue whenever you discuss uh, the question of relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, you were in Congress at a, at a very critical period in, in U.S.-China relations, obviously, with the normalization of ties with the PRC. Um, and, and that obviously has a direct bearing on, on, on Taiwan. Uh, but also, as we see now through the events unfolding in Hong Kong. Now, what, in your view, does the what implications does the, the Hong Kong, the, the Beijing suppression of Hong Kong's democracy have for the future of U.S. Taiwan, U.S. China relations and, and, and also its uh, U.S. relations with, with Taiwan? Oh, democracy is, uh, if that's your question, the importance of democracy? Importance of the implications of Beijing's suppression of democracy in Hong Kong and its effect on how U.S. views Taiwan and, 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 and China's intentions vis-a-vis? -vis. Well, uh, I, I am really not part of politics any longer, uh, uh, having retired, and therefore I, I, I don't want to try to impress you with the fact that I know something that you don't know already. Uh, the fact is, however, uh, that I think that Hong Kong has proven to be the Achilles heel of China. Uh, I was uh, present with uh, some of the, uh, uh, when the takeover occurred, and uh, I think Margaret Thatcher gave up too much at the time without getting something in return. Uh, and uh, I think also uh, that uh, the uh, procedures to, uh, at present time with Hong Kong and the repression that is taking place is something that uh, gives pause uh, for Taiwan when they think of making a future relationship. Yeah, no, no, no absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that's, uh, that's absolutely spot on uh, in terms of uh, the impact that it's having in Taiwan, you know, in a lot of the research that we're doing here in terms of public opinion in Taiwan, observing public opinion, and, uh, and, 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 and the continual references to the events in Hong Kong uh, for um, you know, the preservation of Taiwan's own democracy, which has you know, been, um, you know, been, been um, you know, such an a, uh, important aspect of the, uh, the values-based relationship that uh, the United States emphasizes uh, with, with Taiwan uh, now. Um, you know, this is... Um, is, is there something that, and in, just in with this topic uh, briefly, is there, you know, can and what can the United States do uh, 
uh, to prevent what's happening to Hong Kong from, from happening to Taiwan. I, I know there's been a great deal of public attention now being paid to you know, the, uh, Hong Kong and, 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 and officials spotlighting, you know, uh, you know, if Hong Kong is, you know, what happens in Hong Kong now, Taiwan could, could happen to Taiwan next. Um, but is there, you know, what can the United States do here uh, in, this, in this regard? I think uh, the United States can do nothing uh, to get involved in that situation. This is China's problem, and China shall have to solve it on their own. Mm-hmm. The United States can be advisory and uh, state their opinion. Uh, look, the United States has fought wars to preserve democracy in other lands. Uh, their position is pretty well known. Uh, and uh, we uh, encourage uh, China uh, to loosen the strains so far as giving the people of uh, uh, of Hong Kong uh, opportunities and freedoms on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was on a mission uh, to Hong Kong in 19, let's see, 1962, uh, when President Kennedy uh, appointed me uh, to a trade commission, trade mission. And I stayed there and, and got acquainted with the people there. And they were uh, really uh, concerned about their future. And it isn't until somewhat uh, 40, 50, 60 years later uh, that they are now uh, engaged in a struggle to regain uh, what they had given up. You know, you you know, you mentioned the distinction between Hong Kong and Taiwan, and and you know, in, in, in Hong Kong being in sort of an internal matter of, of of, of China, the People's Republic of China, um, and um, and this is goes to the, the broader policy sort of question again um, with regards to you know the uh, the U.S. approach to Taiwan and China, and that you know again goes to the sort of the, uh, the various. Um, authorities of various policy uh, formulations, and one that you know often often gets re, um, uh, referenced in uh, U.S. official positions uh, with regards to Taiwan uh, and um, uh, and China is is a one China policy, or or more specifically, you know, our one China policy, or the U.S. one China policy. Um, oftentimes, though, this often gets conflated with the People's Republic of China's One China principle. Um, now, what is the distinction, in your view, between the U.S. One China policy from the PRC's One China principle? Well, you know, I've, I have looked at uh, the One China policy for a long time. And the United States, I don't believe I have seen ever the fact that the United States uh, indicated that there was a one, there is a one China policy, but that conflicts with what Taiwan wants. Uh, It conflicts with the ideas and and what China wants, uh, that there is one China and one Taiwan. Uh, We have never clarified what the one China policy is. Right. I yeah. mean, what we did in, in the various communiques, which I said were advisory, what we did is we acknowledged that both sides said that there was one China. And uh, so therefore, uh, I don't think the United States has a one China policy. Uh, they may have a one country policy, but mm. not a one China policy. That's very interesting. Um, if, if, if I could stick with the, the communiques again, as you mentioned, they are advisory. Um, it's probably no secret um, that, you know, uh, that Beijing has been angling for a fourth communique for some time now. This was documented in, in congressional studies, um, you know, and, um, and, and for instance, the, you know, I think the first sort of uh, noted incidents, instant, uh, instant where uh, Beijing tried to, you know, negotiate or start a negotiation on one was 
back in 1997 uh, between uh, Jiang Zemin and, and, and President Clinton. Um, and there was you know, some uh, discussions going on in 2017 about the possibility one. Uh, with talks now- talking about the time of the assurances? Uh, no, 19, uh, 2017 and 1997, and then oh. 2000, first time being that, that, that noted, um, this was a study done, um, a congressional study published by the Congressional Research Service that documented, you know, uh, these instances where I think Beijing tried to, um, try to uh, uh, neg- uh, initiate discussions about one. Um, you know, with talks now being uh, of a of a reset in U.S.-China relations, with China wanting to reset in U.S.-China relations, uh, what, in your view, is the likelihood of a of a of a of a fourth communique now? What is my feeling again? I'm sorry. Uh, what is the likelihood uh, that uh, that there would be a fourth communique? You know, being that there's a thir- the three communiques now, um, you know, between the United States and China. You know, China has been trying to, um, you know, initiate uh, discussions on a fourth one since as, early, as as far back as 1997. They've tried, you know, repeatedly, you know, over the years under various administrations to do so, but have not been successful in doing so. Um, uh, not suggesting that it would be any more successful this time around, but you know, what is your sort of your your sense of the? Um, of the necessity of one, perhaps, or, or what are the sort of the, the, the challenges of it? Well, I really don't understand the impact of your question. Mm. Uh, I, I uh, suppose the, it's really sort of the, the, the implication, what, or, what are the uh, the possibility of a fourth communique. But if you know, if I mean, oh, that's I think- really speculative right now at this point. I, I, it is a speculative question. So if you prefer not to answer that, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Well, the world is so unsettled. Yeah. The one thing that we can say about the virus is the fact that it is bringing the world together to fight, if, if to fight this uh, enemy. So that's one uh, problem I have always said, that if there was a intrusion uh, into this present world uh, by some spacecraft from outer space, the world would get together. (laughs) And it didn't take a spacecraft. It took uh, really uh, a virus that knows uh, that there are no safe havens. And uh, the fact that we are all, um, that mankind itself is at stake now. Uh, so therefore, I think we all we all have to put the, put our differences aside and concentrate our efforts on defeating this virus. Mm-hmm. This virus is so virulent that it is uh, impossible to forecast its end. I frankly don't see an end to this. I see a a, a continual struggle. Uh, to keep uh, our, our people uh, safe. The vaccine is only going to uh, give us a temporary respite uh, from uh, another intrusion by another type of virus or something like that. So look, we are, uh, when you come down to it, the common cold has been with us for centuries. And we haven't found an answer to it. Pneumonia continues to be require us to have uh, vaccinations against it. The world needs to get together to now uh, to stop the destruction of mankind. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you um, for that very. Um, I know I haven't answered well, your question. No, I, I appreciate it. No, it's it's fine. I I, <laughs> I understand. It's fine. Um, it's you know, and I think so. So, so these necessity of of cooperation is certainly a a, a thread that I think is uh, apparent in the, you know, the uh, in the incoming um, uh, Biden um, administration. Um, some prominent uh, foreign policy thinkers. Um, you know, such as Richard Haas, uh, from the president, of, who is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, um, has 
advocated for the United States to move from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity in terms of U.S. commitment to defense of Taiwan. Um, what is your you know, position on, 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 on this uh, proposal? Um, as I'm sure you, you understand and know uh, how you know, Beijing likes to sort of tie different issues together and, and you know, efforts to try to, um, uh, to, try to uh, cooperate with China uh, may uh, uh, inevitably uh, elicit Beijing's attempts to uh, to uh, to seek concessions on, on on U.S. positions with regards to Taiwan, and especially in a period now where China is ratcheting up its military pressure on on Taiwan and the the prospect of military conflict rising. Um, you know, what is your th thoughts on, on on moving from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity? Well, on what again? I'm sorry. Uh, strategic clarity in U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan. Uh, so uh, Richard Haas and David Sachs over at the Council on Foreign Relations, a prominent U.S. think tank uh, in New York, has uh, advocated for the United States to shift from strategic ambiguity, which is obviously, as you know, before our audience members, you know, uh, not committing uh, either to the uh, to defend Taiwan in the event of an invasion uh, or not not committing to defend Taiwan. So leaving it ambiguous whether or not the United States would intervene. Now, Richard Haas has, you know, advocated for strategic clarity, so that you know, um, not a, not a, not a, um, not an unconditional uh, commitment, but uh, one that um, you know would uh, at least commit U.S. Ta U.S. Uh, to the defense of Taiwan in the event of a unprovoked. Um, uh, well, if I if I understood your question, and I I, I don't think I did, uh, but I think that. Uh, uh, would you please repeat that because of the fact that I did not get it was... Oh, sure. Uh, no. Uh, to simplify the question is, uh, there's been a lot more discussion about the need to move from strategic ambiguity in U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan to strategic clarity, uh, suggesting that the United States should make an explicit commitment to the defense of Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. Uh, what is your... You know, sort of position on that. What does the TRA, um, you know, um, um, uh, st uh, say about the defense of Taiwan? Well, I, I I really can't answer that because of the fact that I I'm, I'm not clear as to the guts of of, of your question. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I really... if, I, if I may, if I may, uh, Congressman Wolf, uh, should the United States uh, make a, an explicit commitment to defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack on Taiwan? Uh, I, I feel very strongly that the United States should not get involved in what could be an internal affair. Uh, the one thing that I think is important is I, I feel very strongly that China's influence on international organizations is such that it, uh, contrary uh, to the idea uh, of uh, of reality, one of the strong points that we put into uh, the Taiwan Relations Act was the fact that Taiwan uh, should not be kept out of international organizations and should be part of them. Uh, and China continues to block passage. There are problems that go beyond politics. I mean, the health of the, of the world, transportation, over different lands. These are things that are international and are not, uh, not subject to uh, geographical limitations. Uh, I, I, I strongly believe uh, in the fact that if Taiwan was uh, permitted to join many of these international organizations, uh, they would have uh, 
that China would have less difficulty in justifying its position. Right. I mean, I think that's a very well taken point, which is, you know, if, you know, if you want to, you know, promote peace in the Taiwan Strait, I think we should, you know, create conditions that would put Taiwan in a, in a, in a, in a better position to negotiate because to negotiate this, uh, a political settlement to, uh, to this, uh, to this, uh, to this political issue um, uh, between uh, Taiwan and China. Um, I, I want to get to the audience Q&A, but I do have one last question for you. This is related to, again, to broader policy relates to the Taiwan Relations Act and, and Congress and Congress's role. Um, over the past uh, several years, uh, Congress has demonstrated a great deal of activism uh, in shaping Taiwan policy. Uh, this is evident in the uh, uh, unanimous passage of the Taiwan Travel Act, which encourages high level official visits between US and Taiwan and the aptly named uh, Taipei Act, which has to do with supporting Taiwan's international diplomatic and non-diplomatic space. What do these legislations do in terms of the substance of the Taiwan Relations Act and Taiwan policy in general? Well, first of all, I, I do think that it's ridiculous. I remember when uh, Li Tang Wei uh, came to the United States to accept a diploma uh, from uh, his university here. And that's a silly re restriction. And it's more in the interest of China to have uh, the consultations between the United States and Taiwan. Because uh, China must understand uh, that uh, the American people, even though they have very little knowledge of Taiwan support uh, the democracy that is Taiwan. And the idea of having consultations uh, between uh, political people of Taiwan and the members of the United States uh, is uh, uh, just a silly type of restriction and the United and it should be lifted. Uh, more and more you're seeing uh, the uh, uh, loosening of that type of thing, but the United States uh, is still bound by its diplomatic recognition uh, of China and respecting some of the elements uh, that uh, uh, divide us uh, because the, the uh, uh, United States position uh, is not to be, again, uh, provocative. Look how many, how many uh, uh, missions uh, to uh, uh, Taiwan have been set up with the Congress. And that's where the, that's where the, the power lays. Uh, lies with uh, uh, the relationship between Taiwan and the United States. Uh, you know that uh, these silly uh, frills and uh, chest beating uh, do nothing to solve a problem. It only exacerbates it. And what harm would there be if uh, American diplomats uh, went to China without proclaiming anything in the way of change of status. Mm -hmm. All right. and you I think the, the act was a good one. Right, the Taiwan, yeah. Right, okay, well, thank you so much for, uh, for, for addressing my questions. And I do have a lot more, but I, I do want to get to the audience Q&A. And we have uh, plenty of questions. Uh, in the event that you have not already submitted your questions, uh, you may do so on the chat function on, this is to our audience members, chat function on our YouTube page, um, as well as Twitter uh, by tweeting us at Global Taiwan, or by sending us an email at, uh, at contact at globaltaiwan.org. Make sure to state, uh, to include your name as well as your affiliation uh, when um, uh, <coughs> 
So uh, we have some time for about 15 minutes um, uh, for Q&A. We might run over with your permission, uh, Mr. Wolf. If you have a little additional time, we can go over a little bit more if, if we were really, um, you know, if you, find, if you really like these questions. Um, first question here is from uh, Tina Chung uh, with the Voice of America. The question is, the Trump administration has taken a more direct approach to counter Beijing's pressure on Taiwan, taking steps to support and have closer ties with Taiwan. Do you expect Biden with his familiarity with the Taiwan Relations Act will do the same as Trump? Do you see a better or worse US-Taiwan-China relations uh, in 2021 with a Biden administration? I think that uh, I, I knew Joe Biden. He's a really decent man and he's an honest man. And he believes in the constitution uh, uh, of the United States. I think relationships will continue to flourish as long as there is a reason for it to flourish. But if there's provocative acts upon either side I think it's going to change his views. I cannot speak for him at all. I cannot speak for the American people. Look, I'm retired. <laughs> I, 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 I do believe, however, that, you know, what is very strange, the actually, the people who were involved in the Taiwan Relations Act were the liberals of this country uh, Kennedy, uh, Teddy Kennedy, and Cranston, and uh, uh, myself, all liberals were the ones that created the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and when the, uh, uh, when the situation uh, came about for uh, uh, voting for the act itself, uh, it was the liberals who voted for it, and some of the hardline conservatives did not vote for the act itself. And that's strange. But I do think that relationships will continue well, and I think that there's a good reason for the relationship uh, to continue. The next question is from Chris Nelson from Samuels International, whom I believe worked for you at some point uh, long ago, uh, because in his email to us, he said, hi, boss. So he referred to you as, your, as his boss. So his question is, and this is something that we talked about uh, briefly in our, in our Q&A. His question is, what is your advice to friends of Taiwan who want to make literal and explicit that in the event of hostilities between Ta China and Taiwan, that the US military automatically will join in. Has, quote, strategic ambiguity, end quote, past its time, or is it still prudent? Well, like any other, any other situation, uh, this will depend entirely uh, upon the Congress and how it feels at the moment with the relationship uh, with Taiwan and the importance of Taiwan. Uh, in a military situation, uh, I think that so far as the United States is concerned, uh, Taiwan uh, is an ally uh, that uh, we consider very important to our security and defense. And I think Congress will be uh, very well advised uh, to answer any challenge that is made. Next question here is from Dennis Embarth, uh, who is a, a longtime Taiwan-based uh, journalist. Um, when you were the chair of the Asia Subcommittee of the House Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Representative Wolf, you made an extremely important visit to Taipei in early January 1980 in the wake of the Kaohsiung incident, or otherwise known as the Formosa Magazine incident of December 10th, 1979. Um, 
and the KMT's government crackdown on the Deng Wai opposition. Uh, Dennis, the, 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 the questioner, was in Taipei then, and it seemed that this visit uh, was critical in easing the degree of repression. Could you describe your, you discuss your own perspective and experience with this uh, visit and on you know, human rights and democracy in, in, in Taiwan? Well, I recall very vividly uh, and uh, actually uh, were in contact with many of the people that were involved in that incident, notably in Ed Liu, uh, who was uh, jailed uh, at that time and who later became your vice president. Uh, I, I think that that was an incident that ever, that was almost a turning point uh, of uh, uh, Taiwan uh, in its uh, uh, quest uh, for freedom and democracy. And uh, I think we have to do, give due credit to those who made the sacrifices in those days uh, for the uh, ability of Taiwan uh, to prosper as it is today. Uh, I, I must add one thing to uh, here, uh, and that is in the in, in crafting the Taiwan Relations Act. I must say that Fred Shen played a very important role in advising us as to uh, some of the positions that needed to be taken in order to protect the freedom of the people of Taiwan. Okay. Uh, next question uh, comes from Wenxing uh, Chang, uh, a reporter with the United Daily News, a major uh, newspaper in Taiwan. Uh, question is, during the conversation, um, Mr. Wolf stated that, quote, I think it's time to start the ping pong diplomacy once again, end quote. Does it mean that the United States and China deserve a new period of engagement? Uh, would you please elaborate more on your the meaning of your statement? Uh, comment on what? Comment on the statement that you had made earlier during our conversation that you said that you think it's time to start the ping pong diplomacy once again. Well, uh, and that's contained, uh, by the way, uh, I have to give uh, uh, credit to the uh, National Archives, uh, uh, National uh, Security Archives uh, group uh, who uh, helped uh, to uh, get the uh, lifting of the classification on the conversations that took place uh, before uh, in the original uh, type of informal relationship. Uh, actually, uh, the if you go through that, that which is in the book, uh, if you go through that, you'll see the type of of, of uh, uh, activity that was engaged in by Nixon and and uh, uh, and uh, Kissinger, uh, and how much. Uh, Taiwan was part of those negotiations without Taiwan having a say, the people of Taiwan having a say, and the United States Congress. Uh, it, it, it evidences very clearly that uh, we were more interested at that time uh, in the relationship with China than we were in preserving democracy and freedom for the people of Taiwan. Mm. Are, are you then suggesting that this ping pong diplomacy should be directed between the United States and Taiwan? Is that yes? Is that, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I, I, I think it'd be a good idea <laughs> if Taiwan <laughs> challenged the ping pong team of China right now. <laughs> right. All right. Heard it here first. Um, uh, so our next question is from uh, Garrett Vanderweiss. Uh, who is an advisor with uh, GTI. Um, Garrett, his question is, you were part of the leaders in Congress who in the 1980s played such an important role in pushing Taiwan towards democracy. The quote, gang of four, 
uh, with Kennedy, Pell, and Leach. Now that Taiwan is a full democracy, should we move towards more normal relations with Taiwan? Yes, I think we should. Uh, it doesn't matter whether there are, when you say normal relations, that's important because of the fact that it, you, you uh, eliminated the word diplomatic. Uh, you know, I uh, had great, uh, Henry Kissinger and I went to the same school together. Uh, not together, but uh, we, I was, uh, I believe, two terms ahead of him. Uh, but we differed so much on what was the question of normal uh, relationship and diplomatic relationship. Uh, and uh, normal, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, uh, I'm always uh, brought bring to mind uh, the question uh, of uh, the relationship between Congress uh, and the State Department. Uh, sometimes the State Department treats Congress almost as the enemy, and that is unfortunate uh, and it prevents us from doing uh, the normal relationship. I used to say there's state talk and straight talk. Uh, <laughs> so that I do believe that it's important that for the United States to proceed on its own uh, and the Congress to proceed with joint meetings uh, between the members of the uh, uh, China, uh, the members of uh, uh, the Taiwan Parliament and the United States. And I encourage members of the United States Congress to visit Taiwan, to see what Taiwan is all about. You know, there's another important difference here that I think should be uh, really understood. Uh, the Western mind and the Eastern mind uh, are different. Uh, what I mean by that is the fact that I don't think you can badger or browbeat the Chinese into making a change of position. Uh, I, I think that's important uh, yeah. for us to consider. I mean, the idea that that uh, uh, Trump has used just now of using all the trade uh, uh, policies with China and and uh, uh, using this heavy hand, we never get anywhere with that. I recall very vividly. A meeting I had in Hong Kong many years ago when I was trying to get into China, I was trying to be one of the first into China. And uh, uh, what happened is a reporter came to me at the height of this and said, uh, I need to have uh, an interview with you. I said, I have no time, I'm having breakfast. She said, please, my, my uh, editor will fire me unless I get the interview. So I said, all right, come up. And she came to my room and I was having breakfast. And I said to her, will you join me? Will you have a cup of tea? And she said, no, thank you. And then I realized I should put that cup of tea before her. And when I put the cup of tea before her, she took a sip of that tea. Hmm. And that is uh, uh, an indicative of the fact that we really don't understand China. And China and Taiwan, they don't understand us. Very, very interesting. Um, our next question is from Yang Bennett uh, from Princeton. Does Mr. Wolf have a sense of the current leadership? I think uh, referring to China's, China's leadership under Xi Jinping and how its strategy compares and differs with the old leadership that you are uh, certainly more familiar with, with the Deng Xiaoping era. How should the incoming administration, the Biden administration, negotiate with the current leadership uh, under Xi Jinping, who I think, by all accounts, have been, um, you know, uh, is is has been uh, much of a very much of a strong man in in in, in, in uh, dealing with um, with with issues. Related. I think that she is uh, she epitomized the uh, iron fist and the velvet glove. 
and I think that that's important uh, to uh, understand and that really uh, clarifies what I was trying to say before about uh, uh, the question uh, of leadership and how you go about achieving things. Uh, one thing that's very important is the fact that there are many things that are said that are politically expedient locally and domestically. And the same thing uh, is true uh, that those uh, things that are said domestically uh, do not influence uh, their worldwide uh, uh, views. I think that she has done a very good job, a remarkable job uh, in handling the situation today because of the fact that these are critical times and uh, could spark, uh, look, the reaction of uh, the, the Taiwan Air Force to the intrusions by the Chinese uh, could spark war. I mean, we've to, had to incidents here, like uh, that before. To be, to be clear here, Representative Wolf, you're, you're referring to uh, President Tsai Ing-wen of, of, of Taiwan. I think, are you, uh, the question I believe was referring to uh, Pre uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping and, and when what, oh. uh, and, and, but no, I think that's great. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. For that. that's, no, that's a great, that, I think that's a, you know, I'm glad you addressed that also as well. And please continue your thoughts on that and then maybe trip it over to how to deal well, with- I, I thought you meant uh, uh, President Tsai. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I think he is solidifying his power uh, and has uh, uh, really achieved uh, control uh, of his people. And one part of it is the fact that the economic success has helped him. Uh, and if, if the economy goes bad and he uh, uh, loses power, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan is an easy target for him. Uh, so I think it might make him uh, more uh, uh, more reliant upon outside influences to shore up uh, any deficiencies he might have uh, in his uh, uh, local control of, of uh, government. I think he's done a good job in what he has done. I think he has produced a, uh, uh, a goodly success economically and brought his people together all the way. I understand that the young people of China, I have a lot of friends, uh, the Chinese friends who come back and forth. Uh, and uh, I find that the young people are not very happy uh, with uh, some of the uh, rules and regulations that they must adhere to. And I think it uh, should uh, bear uh, consideration uh, by Xi Jinping in order to uh, try to uh, satisfy the aspirations of these young people. Now we have a lot of Great questions, and unfortunately, due to the the, the limits of time, I, I do want to close with one question with uh, from our uh, from all, another member of our advisory board here, uh, from uh, from uh, David Tai. Um, and his question, um, if I were to summarize it, um, is: What are the the role of Taiwanese Americans as well as um, Taiwan uh, government at the time? in the legislative process of the formulation of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and he's referring, he referred to, you know, um, uh, perhaps uh, meetings with uh, Taiwanese Americans that maybe you might have had in, uh, in 1979 and, uh, and others that have helped inform what you thought were necessary in, um, in dealing with, uh, you know, the future of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Well, uh, I do think uh, if I got the question correct, uh, and because of transmission here, uh, my being able to uh, to decipher in some fashion uh, your questions 
is a little bit clouded, but let me say that one important aspect of the relationship between Taiwan and the United States is the de facto embassy uh, that you have in Washington. When I say de facto, these are, these are ambassadors that you send here and the people that work for you are, are diplomats. Uh, Tecro has done an outstanding job. Sometimes uh, they have uh, been, um, well, sometimes the representatives uh, over the past that uh, you have sent uh, here have not been of the highest quality. Uh, most times they are, and uh, the, uh, it is important uh, for uh, the uh, Taiwan uh, to send the highest uh, possible quality of representative here. I think that the, uh, the people that you have uh, here uh, should be experienced and knowledgeable about America and American uh, affairs and not be someone who's just read a book about America. Uh, I think this one, is, right? I mean, this one. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, okay, before, uh, before I let you go, I, I have to get one last question in, uh, and this is a personal question, but I'm sure it's on a lot of people's mind. So what is your secret for a long and happy life? What is my secret, what? For a, a long, long and happy life, yeah. Well, uh, belief in God, uh, that's the most important because uh, that controls everything. But the also is question of moderation and not uh, do things in extreme fashion. Uh, and one thing I do, you know, uh, people have asked me that for a long time. And one thing I, I am, uh, uh, very, uh, loyal uh, to having, uh, something known as smoked, uh, salmon in the morning. Oh, okay. And I found out, yes. That's the secret. That smoked that, salmon. Got it. That is fish oil. <laughs> and as a result of that. I have it virtually every morning since I have been, uh, I lived in, in Denmark for a, a time and that's what got me into it in the first place. Uh, but uh, I have adhered to that, a uh, low meat diet and uh, again, uh, uh, moderation in things I do. I continue to exercise every day I uh, uh, enjoy uh, music and I enjoy being a dilettante in politics. And that you are, uh, certainly. Uh, well, thank you very much, Representative Wolf, for everything that you have done for this country and for U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, for anyone interested really uh, in doing primary source research on uh, US-Taiwan relations on the Ta and the Taiwan Relations Act, Representative Wolf's book, uh, The Legislative Intent of the Taiwan Relations Act is a must read um, because he compiles all the essential documents in, in, in one place. So if you have not already received, uh, signed up to receive all our program updates, you may do so directly uh, by signing up um, on our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. And thank you all uh, for joining us for today's program. And most importantly, stay healthy. Take care. And thank you for having